right, so now we're going to look at the different types of mineral composition and the partner rocks for these igneous rocks that we're looking at. Now, keep in mind that the igneous rocks that we are examining in this class are not all the igneous rocks that there are. But in order to make it reasonable for an introductory geology student to, to handle it in the short amount of time that we're covering it, uh, we've cut it down to just the basics and the more common rocks and sort of the end members of different families. And that just makes it a little bit easier so that you can do some interpretation, learn some basic foundations. And if, you be, if you're a geology major or you become a geology major and you go on, you would take igneous petrology, which is study of igneous rocks, and you would learn a lot more about the different types of rocks and um, their histories. But we're gonna start very simply, and it, it's, it actually works pretty good for most rocks, so you'd even be able to go on a hike somewhere and, and speak intelligently. So, <clears throat> I mentioned before, this is a coarse grain rock, this is granite. Its partner rock is rhyolite. Now, rhyolites can be pink or gray, they're usually light gray or pink, um, pink if they have a lot of potassium feldspar, like this one, and if they didn't have a lot of potassium feldspar like this one or this one, then they would uh, not, just like this one's not pink, the corresponding rhyolite, if there was one without a lot of potassium feldspar, would not be pink. It would be gray. I don't have a gray one here with me because I don't have all of my rocks from the classroom, but um, you can imagine a light gray rock would also be a rhyolite. So we've got pink or light gray, fine grain rock is rhyolite, a coarse grain pink or um, relatively light gray uh, rock from a distance, even though it's speckled from a distance, it might look gray or um, you know, more, more white than, um, than when we get to diorite, we'll look at those. So these two, the granite and the rhyolite have the same minerals and they are defined part by their minerals and, and then of course their, their texture. So in order to name an igneous rock, we first need to know what minerals are in it and then the texture. So the minerals that are in a granite, I mentioned before, are, um, it's actually 80 60 to 80% what are referred to as non-ferromagnesian minerals, silicate minerals. Those non-ferromagnesian minerals are the light colored minerals, generally speaking, and um, they do not contain iron or magnesium. That's where the ferromagnesium comes from. Ferro for iron, magnesium for magnesium. So these are generally light colored rocks composed of 60 to 80% light colored minerals. More towards the like 70 to 80 than the 60, but it's still possible. So <clears throat> that's why this one, these, these ones right here from these pebbles to this cobble are all relatively light colored. Now if you look at the, um, there's a, you should have a handout in the lab um, or in your packet there uh, that is some circles with uh, black and white dots. Either a black background with white dots or a white background with black dots. And those are what are our visual estimators. So in order to be able to um, accurately or fairly, fairly accurately without having to count, literally count what's present in the rock, which we do we do do that actually, lay a grid on it either uh, if we're looking at a microscope slide or even a rock itself and everywhere where there's a crosshair you count that mineral and that's how you would get a, a percentage of uh, light versus dark minerals um, accurately. But we can use these visual estimators and that gets us in the ballpark most of the time and it's, it's, it usually works really well. So if you look at those estimators um, with the light background with the dark dots, um, look at the one that's 60 percent 80 percent so um, that means if you have or, or that, let me take that back so look at the, the light background if it's 60 to 80 percent light then you're gonna look for the 40 20 to 40 percent um, circles because those will be 20 to 40 percent dark minerals so that's what these are 20 to 40 percent dark minerals that's hornblende and biotite those are the ones that contain iron and or magnesium and the rest of it is going to be the feldspars, plagioclase, and or case bar, and quartz. Um, there might be some muscovite in there too. Muscovite's usually smaller, a little harder to see, but it's also a non ferromagnesium magnesium mineral, uh, so no magnesium or iron. So that's granite and rhyolite, same minerals, different texture. Granite, if it's 
quartz, feldspar, um, biotite, uh, hornblende, 80 to 60 to 80 percent light colored, then we uh, and coarse grained, then it's a granite. Of course, to determine the mineralogy of this one, we would need to use a thin section. A thick section, thin section is we cut a, a chunk of rock and we make it about one inch by two inches in size. We glue it to a glass slide. Then you cut off, you trim it down, and you grind what's ever left. You try to get as close as you can without getting cutting the slide or cutting a rock entirely off. And then you slowly grind down that last little bit, polish it up, and um, except for a few minerals, we can pass light through them. And then there's some tricks that we can use um, with a, a, a petro, what's called a petrographic microscope or a rock microscope that allows us to inter, um, identify minerals very, very carefully. Uh, then we could see what minerals are in here. The other option we have is if I grind this up and I put it into a container and I put it into a machine called an X-ray diffractor or an X-ray fluorescence, two different machines do the same thing, roughly. Uh, it will X-ray the sample and every crystal, every mineral has a specific X-ray pattern and the computers can identify those patterns and say how much of my rock is each mineral. But I'm not gonna be able to do it in hand, span, hand, hand sample like this because I don't have x-ray eye vision and I, don't, I can't zoom in to the, the, the you know, less than a, than a millimeter in size. So I'm not gonna be able to identify that. But I can say by looking at it being pink like this or light gray, very light colored, then I can be fairly confident that it's rhyolite. Now this one, this is diorite. This is going the next step up in uh, to the um, to the left, sorry, to the right of the um, on your diagram. The top rock is diorite, and its partner rock is andesite. So coarse grain, fine grain. This is about if you if you were to take a guess at your visual comparator, what might you say the percentage of light and dark is for one of these? Most students, most people agree it's pretty close to 50-50. And that's generally about the recognition is that it's about 50% light, about 50% dark. It could be off by a little bit, but it's really close to that 50-50 range. The dark minerals are hornblende. The light mineral is mostly plagioclase. There can be a small amount of quartz in here. Um, some people define diorite as having no quartz. Some people, some igneous petrologists define diorite as having a small amount of quartz. Um, for our purposes, it won't have enough for you to see like you can in, in, in granite. So we just pretty much say it's plagioclase and hornblende almost entirely. Oftentimes in um, the porphyritic versions of andesite, like this one or this one, we may be able to see chunks of plagioclase and chunks of hornblende. So there'll be some white, larger crystals, more than uh, visible crystals and some um, large enough dark crystals that we can see. I'm going to go ahead and wet this one. Alright, so now with this one taking, it kind of smooths the surface so you can see a little bit better. You can see that light and dark crystals maybe a little bit better. And um, if I do this one, so I, I mostly just have my uh, cobbles. Um, actually, this one's in the wrong spot. But this one is another one. This one is a lot, maybe a little bit darker. So you can see that there's a little bit more dark with this one than light. That can happen as minerals can kind of cluster together. These are fairly small samples, but if we looked at the large space, a much bigger sample, or the outcrop itself, the rock in the field, then we would be able to see over the, over the whole thing, it's pretty close to 50-50. So that's the intermediate, the, the middle ones, these are diorite and andesite partner rocks. They, the andesite also has hornblende and plagioclase, but remember since it's fine grain, we're not going to be as, it's not going to be as easy to identify and hand sample unless it's porphyritic and then we can see it. But if we take these two, you should be able to note that this is much lighter than this one. And that is, you know, as we add more ferromagnesium, more of those iron and um, magnesium rich rocks, or minerals uh, get more uh, towards those the, include more of the darker minerals then the rock itself gets darker so if we go up the next level um, the next rock over will be gabbro gabbro is 80 percent dark minerals 
So there is a little bit of plagioclase in here. It's not that easy to see. You mostly see the pyroxenes in there, the darker ones. There might be some olivine in there too. Uh, but the, so this one has a lot more of the ferromagnesium, a lot more of those dark iron and magnesium rich rock, uh, minerals. So it is darker. So if we look from granite to diorite to gabbro, going from this one is granite, diorite to gabbro, you can see light, medium, and dark. And that's a, a pretty good rule of thumb for identifying the, um, the rocks if they are particularly dark. We're going to go towards the uh, basalt and gabbro side. If they're really light, we're going to move more towards the, dark, the, the, sorry, the uh, granite and rhyolite side. So with basalt, um, now this basalt is quite special. So this basalt actually um, is a pillow basalt, which you may have read in your textbook. So this was actually extruded out onto the seafloor off the coast of Washington. I found it on the beach um, in the San Juan Islands, which are kind of in Puget Sound, um, kind of north of Seattle. And so this was extruded out into water and it forms like these little these uh, pillow shapes, kind of like if you squeezed toothpaste into a bowl of water or the sink or something, a sink full of water, you'd have these like globule bits of, of toothpaste. That's what happens when basalt is squeezed out into water. It's the only place that basalt forms, so any or uh, pillow basalt forms. So if we see that shape, we always know that that basalt was extruded into water, rather than like um, on say Mauna Loa or Kilauea, where it was extruded out onto the surface. So this is actually a mid-ocean ridge basalt that I found on the beach. Um, these are other cobbles, and these are a bit, these aren't as black as often, very, very fresh basalt is often black, but these have been um, weathered a bit, they've been subjected to some stresses and maybe are, uh, they're a bit altered from their original material, but we still identify them as basalt. This basalt um, is actually from Idaho, from uh, part of the Snake River basalt. These are flood basalts where for some unknown reason, and we still don't really understand why, but a rift opened up on land and basalt just poured out. And if you look at, um, on a map, for things like the Columbia River basalts or the Snake River basalts, there's, or if you look, um, go to Google Earth and um, look up uh, Craters of the Moon, National or National Monument, I don't think it's a National Park, I think it's a National Monument or something like that. And it's just, it's just lava flows. If you look at it at Google Earth or Google Maps, you just see this black spot uh, I think it's in Idaho. It's very near. It's in Washington, Idaho area. Uh, this is the, the basalt that flowed out onto the surface. This one happens to be vesicular, but it doesn't have to be. So <clears throat> when we look at um, the, uh, the gabbro, this is the coarse grain one formed underground. We can see the, the pyroxene. We might be able to see some olivine. We can see a little bit of the plagioclase. In this basalt, because it's so fine grained, it's not porphyritic, I can't really identify them. I'd have to do the analysis the, the, with the x-ray uh, x-ray analysis, or I'd have to look at them in thin section. I'd have to do more work. I can't identify them here, but it's a really fine grained dark rock. And I found it on a beach right in, in the middle of an area where there was a subduction zone, or a, a, a subduction zone, and then farther west than that is a rift zone, or a mid, a mid ocean ridge. So, Based on the fact that it looked like these pillows on the beach and it's a dark rock, then I feel very confident it's basalt. And um, if I did an, an analysis of it, I'd find out that's the case. Same thing with the vesicular basalt. Vesicular basalt is really only pr produced by, uh, only basaltic magmas will produce it. So there's other features I can use, even though mineralogy is not visible. Sometimes, we can be a little bit luckier, like this uh, porphyritic one, where we can see the plagioclases and some of the olivines. So we can see that. Now, there is one more rock uh, on our most ferromagnesian. So this is the relatively darkest, except if you look at this one, it actually looks kind of lightish because we've got green minerals in there and we've got black minerals. And those are actually both olivine. There's two different kinds of olivine. There's a, 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 a green one that has uh, it's magnesium rich and there's a black one that is iron rich. So there's still ferromagnesians, it's just that the, the olivine tends to be, if it's magnesium rich, it'll be what we would consider generally lighter. So our rule of thumb of light versus dark for the amount of 
iron and magnesium in it doesn't always work, but it works most of the time, so there's always, there's always a rule breaker somewhere. But this is pretty tight. This is what the mantle's made of. So this one does not form on the surface, so I do not have a, it doesn't form on the surface anymore. It used to when the earth was a lot hotter. We had a rock that, a volcanic partner to this, that is um, called comatiite. I don't have samples of it. We're not going to talk about it again. But peridotite is the mineral that most of the mantle is made of. This one happened to be brought up in a magma, was brought up to the surface. It's, it's a xenolith, or that's Z-E-N-O-L-I-T-H, xenolith, which means different rock. And so this was a chunk of the mantle that got ripped off of the mantle wall, caught up in the magma, and was brought to the surface, and it didn't melt. And because it didn't melt, it was just a chunk of rock, a class, it's, it's not actually a class, but we could think about, remember those inclusions? It's an inclusion in the rock um, that isn't part of, it's older than the, the new rock. So if we saw xenoliths in there, the, the peridotite is older than the rock that it would be contained in. So peridotite's the mantle, gabbro and basalt are the ocean floor, remember? So gabbro is going to be farther down, pillow basalt's on the very, very top, and in between that pillow basalt's at the top, the gabbro way down deep is just going to be plain old basalt in the middle, fine grain basalt. Um, over here with the, the granite and the rhyolite, as well as the diorite and andesite, these are more going to be present, these are more frequently present um, in uh, subductions, near subduction zones in the uh, island, volcanic island arcs and the volcanic mountain ranges. So when that sub subducting plate goes down, uh, water's given off, it starts to partially melt the mantle and that the, the bits and pieces of the mantle that did get melted will start to move up because they're, they're less dense so they're more uh, buoyant and they'll, they'll shoulder away the rock, they'll either melt it as they go or they'll um, uh, just, just use fractures and literally squeeze the way into the rock and move up that way. Uh, so these are, so the diorite and andesite, granite and rhyolite, and then plus our, what I call the weird volcanics, pumice, obsidian, and the tufts are all present in convergent zones. Anywhere where there's subduction, there's a volcanic mountain range or a volcanic island arc, these are present. If we saw a lot of basalt that included gabbro, we saw gabbro somewhere nearby and pillow basalts or um, just regular basalts in that area, then we'd know that a chunk of the seafloor got stuck up onto the continent as the oceanic plate was going down. And those are called ophiolite complexes for a little trivia there. I don't, can't remember if it's in your textbook or not. But a sliver of the seafloor from the gabbro at the bottom up through the sheeted dike complex, which is a bunch of uh, little slivers of basalt stuck in as the plates moved apart in the mid-ocean ridge, and then finally the pillow basalts on top that were injected literally onto the surface in the rift zone into the ocean. The other thing is on land volcanoes that aren't associated necessarily or are, are typically not associated with subduction. They could be hot spots or um, just a temporary uh, faulting that allows some decompression melting down low and that magma can then come up to the surface. So hot spots like Hawaii or some of the, some of the decompression melting that can occur um, when faulting manages to reach far enough down into the mantle that um, uh, some magma can follow, travel up that fault and make it to the surface. So gabbro is usually not seen anywhere near the surface um, unless you've got parts of the ocean stuck on. There are other times that it can happen, but most of the time if we see gabbro, we know oceanic crust uh, got stuck on the continent or we're drilling through the seafloor down deep, um, which we don't do that often. It's really hard to drill through that rock. It's very hard, and so the drill bits have a hard time getting through, and you have to go pretty deep. So that's very expensive to do. Most don't do it. It's usually the result that we see it stuck on land, one of those ophiolite complexes. So we got partner rocks, coarse and fine grain, plus the weird volcanics, and that is our uh, range of the, the igneous rocks that, that we will cover this semester.